I, I want to address uh, Ellen White today. Um, people ask me, why do you even quote Ellen White? Wouldn't it be better if we went sola scriptura, just Bible? And that sounds very good and faithful. And here I am quoting Ellen White a lot. Why do I even do that? So we're going to take a look at who is Ellen White? Why do we quote her? Should we? Should we just go sola scriptura, the Bible alone? And what does that phrase even mean? So a big topic. Uh, it's part one today. And I think it's April 7. We will do part two where we will look at... Um, practical implications, context. We'll look at some difficult quotes. How do we deal with them? Like, don't take a bath on Sabbath. Don't buy a bicycle, for example. Uh, we should always kneel for prayer, quotes like that. And uh, maybe there might even be a part three, but uh, that's my plan today and yep. the next time we meet. Now, having said that, I'm going to kneel and Pray with you, and then we will jump right in to our topic, Ellen G. Y., the biblical concept. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we first of all always say thank you. So thankful regardless of the world and what is happening we thank you that we have you, that prayerfully you have us and our hearts. I want to pray for this faithful uh, group here in Norway, Finland, uh, pockets in the United States, and then all over the world. Different languages, but I pray we speak the language of faith and love. And uh, grant us insight into history, scripture, and your specific plan before the end. So our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I love these little groups. There were maybe, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 people yesterday in church. It was two hours away. I'm going to another one next week. And there, there's so much life and, and hope and faith in these small groups. I think I've cited this before. I'm citing Ellen White now. Testimonies, volume seven, page 21. The, the basis of small companies as a, the effort uh, for evangelism, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it memorized, has been shown to me by one who cannot err. And I regret to this day when I planted a church in 2014, I said at, at 100, we'll split again. Well, then we grew to 150 and then now 250, we should have split and created two or three more small church groups. It is much easier and more effective and more personal to take a group from 20 to 40 than it is from 200 to 400 then the group becomes an institution. And when somebody visits, whether they visit or not, doesn't make any difference. Uh, nobody notices. But in 20 or 30, if somebody's missing, they, they are missed. Different topic. Theology is always, to a degree, biography. What do I mean by that? Our, our theological thinking is very much influenced by, by our life story, not just by scripture. Not that it should be that way, but that's how it is. Oh, incidentally, the, these little group meetings for me are so important. I didn't listen to the radio. I didn't even listen to sermons. On the way home, I, I, I listened to a sermon, but on the way there two-hour drive, I, I just prayed and spent time with God. Um, um, as you may know, I was an exchange student from Germany to America. 
never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. I had walked by an Adventist church many times in Stuttgart, Germany, downtown, because there was a, oh, how would you say that in, in European? <laughs> a hobby shop where, where you do crafts, model airplanes, model trains, and all that. I was not into that as much, but it was still an interesting store. Uh, and then around the corner was an optics store. I was into chemistry, mixing chemicals, not doing drugs. Oh, no. But uh, I loved mixing chemicals, see the reaction. And, and they had those glass tubes for sale and microscopes and binoculars. Oh, I love that stuff. And I usually went on Saturdays and walked by the Adventist church. I only knew there was some kind of cult sect church. It wasn't a Lutheran church. It wasn't a Catholic church. And what else is there? Uh, but never paid any attention to it. Opposite the Adventist church is Jewish synagogue. They share properties at, at the back end of their properties. Uh, and I always notice police there, of course, on, on Saturdays. Not Sabbath, Saturdays. So I came to America and through, a, through miraculous circumstances, I was rerouted from one family to another. First family wouldn't work out, so I went to, to one in Texas. They wanted a student from Spain so their son could learn better Spanish. Y cada día aprendo español. I, I would like to become proficient for ministry in Spanish. but It's a little harder to learn in older age. And, uh, but that didn't work out for them. So I ended up with an Adventist family, became vegetarian overnight. Uh, I had skin issues. My eyes were inflamed, uh, neurodermatitis, I think. My hands were red, sometimes bleeding, especially in the winter. And I was on a heavy dose of prescription strength cortisol. When I became vegetarian, it, it cleared up correlation, probably. But then I also saw on the shelf of this family's home uh, a book called Ministry of Healing. I think it was Ministry of Healing. Not 100% sure, but I think it was. I had never heard of Ellen. Uh, one second. Who is Ellen G. White. Never heard of that author, but I needed healing. I wanted to learn better English. So I, I just grabbed that book off the shelf and started reading. And I, I have had Adventist kids tell me they don't like to read Ellen White. It's She's difficult to read, not interesting. As a non-Adventist, never heard of Seventh-day something. Never heard of Ellen White. I found her writings easy to read. It wasn't simple, but it, it was pleasant to read. It was attractive to read. I had a little dictionary and I looked up words constantly, but it, let me say it this way. It was fun to read. There, there was something in the tone of her voice that was inviting, positive, even when she scolded me, I enjoyed reading her. And it made sense. What she said was logical, thought through, and um, it made sense. So that was my first introduction to Ellen White. She might have been a lady in the community, still alive. I, I had no idea. I saw there were a bunch of books by by. Ellen White. But the question comes up, wouldn't it be better if we just stuck to the Bible? And this is an especially interesting topic for Europe because the attitude towards Ellen White in Europe, I've noticed, and I'm European, is a little different than in America. I remember I was a freshly baked Adventist in Germany. Uh, I went back from America to Germany in 1986. 
And uh, the youth pastor preached a sermon how we should live in the city. We should move to the city as missionary, to reach the city. I, I didn't know much about Adventism yet. I was baptized, but still clueless. But I knew we were supposed to leave the city, come out of the city. So I was quite puzzled by that sermon, but I thought, what do I know? You know I'm little Ingo. I don't know anything. Okay. I was standing in the church there in Stuttgart, and an older brother in his 90s that had explained 1844 to me in his home, his, his wife, good little German family, had baked me a cake. That, that is a good combination, German cake, fruit cake with with Bible study in 1844 and old stories from the war and all that. He cornered that youth pastor in a friendly way, not antagonistic, not accusing, but he said, my dear brother, I, I'm reading in the writings of Ellen White that we should leave the cities, not move into the cities. And the youth pastor said, in my hearing, this is not off the internet or, or YouTube, I heard it myself. The youth pastor said, I do not care what Ellen White says. And I have multiple examples like that. I think it has a little bit to do with Conradi and our history. And so to this day, the statistical ratio of Adventists to non-Adventists in the United States, I think is about one to 300. In Jamaica, it's 1 to 70, I've heard. Bangladesh, 1 to 10,000. Turkey, 1 to 1 million. In Germany, it is 1 to 3,000. America, 1 to 300. Germany, 1 to 3,000. So you have to find 3,000 people to find statistically one Adventist. Would be interesting to see what it is in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And with that, what has in the past move the needle? And is there anything happening short of the latter rain that is changing that statistic? Or are we just stagnant in the Western world? So those were my early impressions with Ellen White. And sometimes I'm thankful that I did not grow up with a lot of baggage. I, I come to this topic fresh. I was originally afraid that I would not have enough material for one hour, but I have too much. So I, I'm going to share a document with you. I want to show you some texts and um, some concepts from scripture in regards to prophets. So I'm, I'm going to go pretty fast. Um, I, I want to give a biblical background to why even quote Ellen White when sola scriptura, just stick to the Bible, would make a lot more sense. It, it takes a little while to develop it. Hang, hang in there with me, uh, but I think it'll make sense. Second Chronicles 20, verse 20, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. When I look at prophets and Pretend I haven't said anything about Ellen White yet, okay? We're, we're starting with a blank sheet of paper from scratch, thinking this through. Prophets uh, have never been very popular. Daniel and Babylon was very much appreciated by the Babylonians, um, but by his own people, I don't know, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he got thrown into a pit, uh, it was difficult to be a prophet because they determine God's way, they define God's will, and they deliver God's word. You like my alliteration here? Uh, seriously, that way, that will, and his word are usually in conflict with my life. Uh, one of my favorite most dramatic scenes in scripture is Gethsemane, where Jesus says, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And the Lord's prayer. I have so much prayed in my life. God, I want to know your will. That's the wrong prayer. I really, I was almost switching to German here. Um, the Lord's prayer says, thy will, your will be done. 
not your will be known. If I know God's will, I might still decide I don't want to do it. It's inconvenient. Uh, don't want to. Right? That's rebellious. But to pray your will be known, that's radical. It's a rather aggressive approach to life because that means you're surrendering and you're letting God define, dictate with your freedom of will the direction of your life. And so by default, I think the prophetic task is a difficult one because it, it runs contrary to me as an individual and to God's people. That's why God sends prophets as a, as a correction, guidance. It's not just information. It's instruction and uh, censorship, uh, correction, warning, caution, but it comes out of God's love. Now, what is really fascinating is we have prophets that are genuine prophets, but they do not have writings themselves in Scripture. What they have said is in Scripture. They are mentioned in the Bible, Sola Scriptura, but they do not have writings in the Bible. Let me give you an example. What am I talking about? I used to ask students, oh, I had fun with that, to go to 2 Elijah chapter 3, verse 34. 2 Elijah book, chapter 3, verse 34. And in the old days, they would, they would turn the pages. <laughs> the Bible is looking for 2 Elijah. Not found. Elijah was a biblical prophet, but he doesn't have his own writings in Scripture. And we have uh, many examples like this. For example, I need to move it just a little. Nathan, Elijah, Elisha, Zadok, Ahijah, Gad, Ido, Shemaiah, Azariah, Hanani, Jehu, who drove too fast, Micaiah, Jedithan, Akariah, Agabus, and others who, who don't have their own writings in Scripture, but they're genuine prophets. Do you see where I'm going with that? Then, of course... We have Jesus quoting a phrase, Moses and the prophets. Gospel of Luke, uh, resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, he, he's like, forget the miracle. If you don't believe Moses and the prophets, um, I, I can't help you any further. Luke 24, I think he uses the triple phrase, Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So that is a complete package of inspired scripture, but it includes prophets that don't have scripture in scripture. You see what I'm saying? Scripture, but not recorded in scripture. Then we have female prophets, <clears throat> um, Deborah, Huldah, Miriam, Noadiah, Philip's four daughters. I don't want to distract. People say, so how can we not ordain women when Ellen White was the leader of the Adventist church. Um, that's a different topic. Um, very specific role as a prophetess. Women can be prophets. They, they, not just women, but all prophets, really the task is to eventually, ultimately get the people of God out of Egypt into the promised land. Uh, we have an example in Exodus 7 verse 1 where Moses is called Elohim. He's called God because he works in God's stead. That There's no intention to identify Moses with divinity, but he's working in God's place for Aaron, who will speak for Moses, who will speak for God. So, But the goal is exodus, deliverance. Then there's a danger, caution, there are false prophets. I have uh, several texts on that. And the destiny is a ripening of God's people for the end time harvest. This is very important to understand Ellen White, and I haven't really mentioned Ellen White yet. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Two texts from the, Old, uh, from the New Testament. Then we go specifically to the book of Revelation. He gave some, Christ gave gifts to the church. And this gifting is to turn 
people into apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. I should read that again. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry. I have a whole sermon on that sometime. The work of ministry is done by the saints, not the pastor. Our entire church concept is, is wrong. Yeah, we're doing church wrong. That's why we're not growing um, statistically stagnant. Yeah, the work of the ministry is done by the saints. But anyway, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. Do we have unity? Not really. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Isn't that something? That's amazing. That unity based on the knowledge of the Son of God is an end time goal and sign. No wonder we're dealing with that issue, right? Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in a nutshell, interesting English expression, right? We wouldn't say that in German. <laughs> we have prophets to prepare us for the end. Simply put, the purpose of having prophets in our midst is to ripen, prepare us for the final phase. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, no spiritual gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I don't want you to miss any of the gifts as you wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. Prophets play an eschatological essential role role. During COVID, my youngest son worked in a grocery store and he had an ex essential exempt card, driving around, delivering food, uh, working. Um, he was essential. And I think he was proud of it too, <laughs> to be essential, to be needed. And profits are essential for our end time existence. Now, I'm going to take you through a sequence in the book of Revelation. I, I need your frontal lobe. It doesn't take long. It's, it's not that difficult or complicated. But if you miss these steps, you will never understand Ellen White, I, I, I don't think. So here we go. Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. John the Revelator, not John the Baptist. He bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. Now think about this. Let's say sola scriptura. We got a problem now. Because John is saying, I am a witness to the word of God. Amen. Sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. The, the battle cry of the Reformation. A friend of mine sent me a picture today that his wife was baking Martin Luther bread. It was bread based on the recipe of, of his uh, Luther's wife, uh, Katie von Bora. He asked me if that was genuine or not. I said, uh, I, I wouldn't question your wife, nor Martin Luther's wife, especially if the recipe came off the internet. Um, but, but in this phrase here, chapter 1, verse 2, we have the word of God, comma, and the testimony of Jesus. So I know I'm repetitious, but this has to sink in. We have the word of God plus something else, even though we, we believe in sola scriptura. Revelation 1 verse 9, I, John, was on the island of Patmos. I've never been. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we have the word of God plus something else. We have A plus B. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest. That's where we get the word remnant from. My little ministry is called remnant research. It's actually a pun on the word search. I'm in search of the remnant. 
I'm, I'm looking for people who want to join the remnant movement. It's not just research uh, in an office. And he went to make war with the rest of the remnant of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Interesting, woman, prophecy, church, then an offspring, Protestantism, if we simplify this. And then there's an, a remnant of the offspring of the woman. So we have the original church. We have an offspring, Protestant Reformation. And then we have another left over from that Protestant Reformation, and they are characterized very specifically, commandments of God and testimony of Jesus. The commandments of God alone exclude 9.9 .9 out of 10 churches. Why? Because of the Sabbath. They, they uphold nine of the Ten Commandments, but not all ten. And I'm going with the Ten Commandments here because of Revelation 11, 18, 19, uh, heavens were open and John himself saw the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments. So there's a group that comes out of Christianity, out of Protestantism. They're, they're the remnant, the leftover, and leftovers are in, in carpentry with carpets. They're, they resemble the original, uh, the original run. They keep the commandments of God, all 10, and they have something else. 14.12, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. A couple of things about this, not a discussion for me today, but I know it's debated, is this a subjective or objective genitive? Is this the faith of Jesus? Is this the faith Jesus had, subjective, Jesus had faith, and, and we need to have that faith, or is it our faith in Jesus. Uh, that's a big discussion in the Advent movement. Uh, the other interesting thing is for a long time, the Adventist church, the Advent movement did not have a creed. They did not have fundamental beliefs. They had fundamental principles, but the creed was Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That one line identified our movement. Now comes something very important. Here comes the critical step. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. I fell at his feet to worship him. So John is a seasoned disciple. He's the beloved disciple. He changed from a son of thunder. He pushed the wrong button. He had a temper problem and he would explode to by beholding you become changed. And he turned into the beloved disciple, drew really close to Jesus. And this veteran, seasoned follower of Christ is emotionally so overwhelmed that he worships an angel. Have you ever made the same mistake twice? I have, unfortunately. So he, he worships an angel, but the angel said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I need to emphasize something here in my document I've highlighted in, in yellow. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Do you know anything about computers? There's random access memory. Can you place this phrase into your random access memory? The brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So in, in John's lifetime... He is a, a fellow servant with others, with uh, other brethren. And those brethren have the testimony of Jesus. And then comes a call to worship God. That is a first angel's message. Command number three, Revelation 14, verse seven. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you have that in your random RAM 
random access memory. Let me read you 22 verse eight and nine. This is the critical step, I think, to understand Ellen White. John saw a huge PowerPoint show, so to speak, of future events overwhelmed. Imagine life goes on for another 2,000 years. The church is struggling. The church turns corrupt. Wars, rumors of war, bloodshed by the millions. And, and John sees that. But then he also sees the glories of heaven. And emotions are a dangerous basis for worship. We probably in the Western world need more emotions than we show. I mean, I can preach a, a really good sermon in Germany, which I don't always do. But the small groups are very appreciative. But in, in a normal Adventist church, you can preach a great sermon and people walk out in Germany shaking your hand, maybe not even looking at you and, and you don't know if you said something wrong or... There are no amens like in other countries. You're like, did, did I do something wrong? And the people love the sermon, but there's no emotional expression whatsoever. <laughs> John fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Mistake number two within three chapters. The angel said, see that you do not do that. That is verbatim identical language from chapter 19. So we have a parallel structure here between 19 verse 10 and 22 verse 8 and 9. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So we have identical language except for a one little detail. And that little detail we need to look at. In 19 verse 10, I'm going to highlight that. Don't know how the camera or the program will pick that up, but... And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So they are, they are fellow prophets, people, believers with John who have the testimony of Jesus. In 22 verse 8 and 9, the phrase testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, is replaced by the prophets. Let me run that through your mind one more time. You cannot miss this. Of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, which testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and now in 22 verse 9, and of your brethren, and the phrase testimony of Jesus gets replaced by the term the prophets. So that means... That God's end time people, if there's a group that has the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, that means that they have a live prophet in their midst. Are you following that sequence? In John's time, people who had the testimony of Jesus were prophets. If we have all the gifts at the end, as Paul prays we do, and in Ephesians 4.11, he says it's, it's end time essential. And, and Jesus sent us prophets for the ripening of God's people before the final harvest. That means at the end of earth history, if we have the gift, we have a living prophet in our midst. Let me give you an example how, how God worked that in Scripture. We have John the Baptist. He prepared the people of God for the first coming of Christ. Uh, and this John the Baptist had no writings in Scripture. Uh, we, we don't have uh, 1 John the Baptist chapter 3, verse 5. But he preached, and he was a genuine prophet. In fact, he was the greatest of them all, as Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 11. His dress was simple. His diet was simple. He focused on repentance, which we don't like. Uh, John the Baptist says, repent. That means the way you live and what you're doing is wrong. Uh, repentance means you, in Greek, it's metanoeo. It means you change your mind. And when you change your mind, really, then you change your actions too. And as far as we know, John the Baptist performed no miracles. 
that's very important to keep in mind this, this concept of John the Baptist. Change dress, change diet, focus on repentance, which is legalistic to many people. No miracles, but sent by God. In fact, when I was ordained in May of 1998, the conference president picked John 1 verse 6 for my ordination text. There was a man sent by God. I have not always lived up to that high calling. Matthew 11, verse 11. Jesus says, Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Luke 7, verse 30. Now comes a warning. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having baptized by John the Baptist. I'm going to stop the screen share for a second so I can look at you. You can look at me. Let me tell you something. Did, did you catch what that verse is saying? John the Baptist was sent by God hmm, with, a, with a hard message. I mean, he confronted Herod Antipas. You're with the wrong woman. Uh, incest, adultery. Uh, it's a challenging message. In preparation for the coming of Christ, God sent a prophet with a change in dress, change in diet, simple message of repentance, no miracles, preparing God's people for the coming, the first coming of the Messiah. He invited people to get baptized. The Pharisees rejected baptism. And Luke said in chapter 7, verse 30, they rejected the will of God. Wait a minute. The, the message came from John the Baptist. Here it is, rejecting a gift from a prophet that God sent ultimately means that you're rejecting the giver of the gift. Does that make sense? When, when you're rejecting the gift, the prophet whom God has sent, that at some point you are rejecting the giver of the gift, not just the prophet. We have several examples like that with Jesus himself. I mean, he, he confronted Saul on the road to Damascus and Jesus rising from the throne, standing up in AD 34. Stephen saw it. Then, then later, this Jesus appears to Saul and Saul tells Saul. Uh, Jesus tells Saul, Saul, let me rephrase that. Jesus is speaking to Saul. He's saying, you're not persecuting Christians. You are persecuting me. Matthew 25, what you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. So, so it comes back to God or, or Christ when we reject the prophet's voice. We're rejecting the one who sent the prophet. So we have a person sent by God preparing God's people for the first coming of Christ. Wouldn't it make sense? This is the most important phase of the universe, really, right now. A creation, eternity. Um, but, but we are, as far as humans are concerned, we're in the last five minutes. We're in the toenails of Daniel 2. We're in the last five minutes of Earth's history wouldn't it make sense that God sends us a prophet in preparation, specific preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ with a parallel profile to John the Baptist, a change in dress, a change in diet, a call to repentance, not an emphasis on miracles as other Christian movements, Pentecostal movement, charismatic movement, and no writings directly in scripture, but in a sense, a biblical prophet. I, I was wrestling with my navigation system in the car yesterday, trying to find a little church. And then I took a country road home, hoping for wildflowers in Texas to take pictures. I'm, I'm trying to create a creation website that highlights the creator for, for non-Adventists in particular, but it was raining and dark and no pictures whatsoever. 
and I had a hard time with a navigation system. And then I finally used my phone and that worked. So I had a general idea where I needed to go. I had a, a pretty good detailed idea, but then the final stretch, I needed to know where do I turn in 0.3 kilometers. And it would make sense that God in the end doesn't just leave us and says, uh, wish you the best. Uh, hope, hope you hang in there till the end. It would make sense that God sends us detailed instructions that we missed from scripture. Once we get to town and we need to know, okay, we're in the right town, but do we turn on Main Street or do we turn in a, turn here or, or, or there specifically? Details. So let me show you something. What I discovered when I was 17 years old, never heard of Adventist or Ellen White. This will go uh, rather quickly. Here comes a lady named Ellen White with 2,000 visions and dreams, 5,000 articles, 26 books with 55,000 pages published or written. The, the sheer quantity of material is a challenge. How, how do you process that data and information? She is the most translated woman in the history of literature and American literature, over 140 languages. And her emphasis was natural health, simple diet, Ministry of Healing, page 127, the seven doctors plus one new start and a Bible-centric education. I, I would like to research the men that God called first. William Foy, he was called in 1842 to prepare the people for the 1844 event. Uh, Black Friedman, he was so-called mulatto, if my research is correct, black and white mixed. And back then that was an issue. People were very prejudiced against that still are to this day, to be honest. Baptist, he had two visions, preached some, but then stopped. And I think he was genuine, genuine honest, um, but did not pick up the baton, as we would say in English, and run with it. Then came another one, Hazen Foss, Ellen White's brother-in-law. Um, Incidentally, there is a book about William Foy. I haven't read it yet, but uh, looking forward to reading that one, learn more in detail about him. Ellen White's brother-in-law warned her. He received from God the pre-1844 visions, uh, did not cooperate, and he lost the gift. Then he saw Ellen White having a vision. He heard her describe what she saw, and he, he remembered, that's what I saw. And then he said, quote, I'm a lost man. He, he received the gift and rejected the gift and therefore rejected the giver. So very, very dangerous. The, the message originally went to William Foy on Hazen Foss. We would be quoting, instead of constantly saying Ellen White says, Ellen White says, we would be saying William Foy says, Hazen Foss says. <laughs> This is a, hard to imagine. Let me read to you a few uh, quotes from non-Adventists, people outside of our faith system, what they say about Ellen White. It is. Clock, uh, well, you go by 20, uh, it's, it's almost 8 p.m. Uh, I can do this pretty fast, right? What I'd like to do is read to you what other outsiders really from the movement say about her. Then a, a personal experience I've had in regards to Ellen White, I'll read you her first vision and then a warning rejecting the gift. So it won't take long. I'll keep an eye on the clock. Edith Dean, not a Seventh-day Adventist by any means, wrote a book called Great Women of the Christian Faith, page 230. Edith Dean says, quote, Certainly, she, Ellen White, was a spokesman for God, like the prophets of old. 
Her life was marked by humility, simplicity, austerity, divine learning, and devotion. And then we have Mark Knoll. He's an evangelical scholar, author, writer. He wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Now, he quotes a former Adventist. I have his book on my shelf, two meters to my left. He's quoting Ronald Numbers, the creationist, University of Wisconsin. Quote, oh, you got to read this twice, but I'll explain it. How a popular belief known as creationism, a theory that the earth is 10,000 or less years old, I go with 6,000 years, but has spread like wildfire in our century from its humble beginning in the writings of Ellen White, the founder of Seventh-day Adventism. She would actually deny that. It was more her husband, Joseph Bates, Uriah Smith, Jane Andrews, Loveborough, etc., Wagner, uh, Senior and Junior. Um, but that's okay. We'll leave that alone for now. To its current status as a gospel truth embraced by Tens of millions of Bible-believing evangelicals and fundamentalists around the world. What, what is Mark Knoll saying by quoting Ronald Numbers? He is saying that the evangelical world, the, the non-Catholic world, uh, simplified, is indebted to Ellen White for reintroducing creationism to Christianity. And God planned that brilliantly because Origin of Species, I've read it cover to cover. Uh, Charles Darwin was published 1859. First edition of uh, Great Controversy came out 1858. God sent Ellen White as a prophetess, not just so that we can quote her in church. He sent her to the world to counter the number one issue facing Christianity the last 100 years, and that is creation versus evolution. And it's so important because three angels' message, first angel says, fear God, give glory to him for the hour, October 22nd to 23rd, 1844, hour of judgment has come, anti-typical day of atonement, and the last call in the first angel command imperative is worship him who made. In the last hundred years, humanity with humanism coming mostly out of Europe, thank you very much, Tusen Tak, has said, no, God has not made the world. There's sedimentary uh, geology, um, catastrophism with a flood. No, 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 it's millions of years. And that has challenged the church more than anything, I think. And, and the role of scripture, of course, with a German higher critical method. But uh, I find it fascinating that a non-Adventist is recognizing the impetus, the catalyst to reintroduce creationism to Christianity is Ellen White. Then I would like to share a quick story with you. I experienced this myself live. This is not off the internet. This is not from YouTube. I was physically present when Pastor Craig Dossman came to Andrews University. He was a pastor in Oklahoma here in the United States. And um, there is a pastor in Korea who has a church with a membership of one million or more. Paul Yonggi Cho, he now calls him David Yonggi Cho. I know he's been in the news for tax issues, money issues. We'll leave all that alone. Just the idea of, 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 of a church of one million or more. <laughs> Unheard of. Um, Craig Dossman observed in his ministry what I've observed in many of us, that uh, the church is stagnant somewhat. There are faithful people working hard. We have some baptisms. Even in America, if we baptize 30 in one year, that's a lot. And unfortunately, most of those 30 baptisms, one year later, are no longer in church. So we, we see that, and the question comes, is there a better method? What can we do? And Craig Dossman saw that this pastor has 1 million members. So he got an interview with Paul Yonggi Cho in Korea. I was a youth pastor in a Korean church for a while. 
I ate seaweed rice rolled in seaweed. It was not bad. And um, he met with Paul Yonggi Cho, and Yonggi Cho rattled off some church growth strategy. And uh, Craig Dossman said, uh, I want to know your secret. How in the world did you create a church with one million members? I, I have a hard time baptizing 100 people. Uh, and, and growing a church from 150 to 250 is a challenge. What are you doing? And Yonggi Cho supposedly, as Craig Dossman told us face to face, he said, Yonggi Cho looked at the interview sheet and said, oh, you, you're Seventh-day Adventist. I'm back in one second. Yonggi Cho got up, went to his library, and came back with two of these red books, Gospel Workers and the infamous book Evangelism. And he said, I've read your materials from Ellen White, and I'm noticing that you Adventists don't practice what she writes. And one of those quotes was, from Gospel Workers Evangelism, that we should organize the church into small groups. So what Paul Yonggi Cho did, he said, this will work in my Asian culture really well. So I'm, I'm dividing the church into groups of 10, 12. And if you don't show up for a prayer meeting, you get a phone call, a text, a fax, back then a, a message, a visit, a knock on the door. Small little cell groups, because if you miss church in a church of 1,000 people, nobody knows or cares. But if you're missing a small group during the week, Testimonies, Volume 7, page 21, the concept of small companies as the basis for our Christian effort has been shown to me by one who cannot err. If you miss then, you will be missed. And somebody will follow up and invite you again and visit you and care about you. And then a group of 10 will quickly grow to 20 because there's warmth and acceptance and Bible study and prayer and accountability and, and food and social interaction. Week by week by week, not just church for two hours and we go home and take a nap. You see what I'm saying? So 10 grows into 20. Then they split, just like in biology, mitosis. Uh, cell splitting, that creates healthy growth. If it grows too fast, it's called cancer. I don't know what the status is of that church now, uh, out of the loop on that, but Adventists, I know in the 90s, tried to copy evangelicals. Not Ellen White. They tried to copy other Christian groups to grow. That didn't work. I remember I was an associate pastor under a senior pastor, and the senior pastor divided my church into groups. Brilliant idea. Ellen White, right? Well, he did it alphabetically. People lived an hour and a half away from each other, and not every family in church gets along with everybody. That's just reality. So he, he divided the church alphabetically instead of strategically. It didn't work. It fell apart in six months, and then we think that uh, small groups don't work. We tried and give up, and then we're back to same old, same old church. So instead of building a, a small group concept based on inspiration and the writings of Ellen White, we try to copy it from other Christian groups that are very different. They don't have Sabbath. They don't have veggie burgers. They don't have haystacks. They don't have our Adventist dynamic. Uh, doesn't work that way. Um, I have personally experienced it lately. Yeah, yeah, we tried to copy Willow Creek. <laughs> yes, I remember at Andrews, I was a seminary student. Students would, I never did. I thought that makes no sense. But a lot of students went to Willow Creek to see how do they do church and then try to model Adventist churches based on Willow Creek, Bill Hybels. Uh, I always thought, no, that makes no sense. What does he know about Adventism and Sabbath and Ellen White? Anyway, uh, I found it interesting that this concept, rightly implemented, works outside of our movement. And, and we 
argue over Ellen White and, and then ignore her and don't implement what God has, has sent us. Let me read to you our first um, quote, vision from Ellen White. I even have the quote right here. Testimonies, Volume 721. I'm, I'm coming. I'm landing the airplane. The formation of small companies as a basis for Christian, off-Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. Um, that might be an interesting meeting, Eva, house churches. And I, I have a former colleague who built his ministry on, on simple church, home church, house church, where, where you, you don't sit in pews and look at the back of a person. You, look, you sit in a circle and look at each other actually. I think the idea of the huge, massive, big church, mega church with 10,000 or so, I've, I've visited one. I don't think that's the idea. Uh, I don't think that's God's plan. Smaller groups, much more effective. Anyway, first vision, 1844. I would like to show you a picture of that, but I was threatened by general conference attorneys, lawyers. Yes, I'm serious. I was contacted by them and uh, threatened with uh, legal action. I cannot use that picture in a setting like this or on my website. I had to take it down, but it's a beautiful picture, Christ of the narrow way, Ellen White's first vision. Let me read it to you. Early writings, page 1415. While I was praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me when a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which is at the farther end of the path. They have a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light to their feet so that they might not stumble. Psalms 91. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. Some rashly denied the light behind them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. You can readily Google that picture, Christ of the Narrow Way. Beautiful picture, nice colors, and also that stark contrast, keeping your eyes of Jesus versus versus falling into darkness. Love that picture. I would decorate my website and make it my background picture if I could. Interestingly, she had another vision of the green cords. We had to get rid of our buggies, horse and buggies. Then we had to get rid of our suitcases. Then we have to get rid of our bags. Then we draw, uh, leave our shoes behind. And eventually we have to rely on our faith and swing on, on ropes across to the promised land. Less and less material baggage. And every trip I take, including yesterday, I thought I, I still need to simplify my life more. Still too much stuff that weighs me down. Today is Sunday right here in, in Texas. And one of my goals is to go again through my belongings and what can I reduce to be lighter and focus more on God and his word and his people. Three Bible texts and I will close. We can talk. Quick look at the chat. The risk of rejection. Now, I have at times, I admit that, overquoted Ellen White at the expense of scripture. In my personal study, including this morning, um, it is sola scriptura. Preferably in Hebrew right now, I want to know Hebrew better, the original Old Testament language. But, um, and I've recommended to a general conference committee, there was an issue uh, I was part of for two years. We met for two years, lots of research, lots of studies. And I suggested, let's not quote Ellen White, let's not quote Martin Luther or any theologians that not have, let's not have footnotes in our papers. Let us in a circle face-to-face -face, study the Bible for one year. No other source. 
sola scriptura, as a method. Because our study was overloaded with quotes and Hebrew and Greek and food. I mean, that's great, but it was too academic. And we came to no solution and the church still suffers from it. But here's a warning. Just throwing out Ellen White and going sola scriptura runs a great risk. What if, what if God sent Ellen White for our end time movement, inspired by the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible writers? She's not in scripture, but she had the spirit of prophecy. So when we say sola scriptura, that sounds very good and Protestant and holy, but we're risking then silencing a voice that God sent us. The word of God, comma, and. I have a lot more to say about this, but we'll do that next time. Let me conclude with three Bible texts. Luke eleven forty seven. 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them and you build their tombs. The irony of having nice books by Ellen White nicely decorated tombs of the prophets, but we're the ones that killed them. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets which they were shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the last person that died in Second Chronicles, the last book in the Hebrew Bible, it's, it's Genesis, First Moses book, all the way to Second Zechariah, not Malachi in uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Amos 2 verse 10, also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons as prophets some of your young men as Nazarites, is it not so, O children of Israel? And we have to say, yes, it is so. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets to say, do not prophesy. Jeremiah 25, verse 4, the Lord sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early, sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. Loma Linda has a, a website on Ellen White and history and the pioneers. Uh, these pictures come from that. Here's a picture of James and Ellen White, 1854. By the way, that first vision that I just talked about in December 1844, do you know how old Ellen White was at the time? That's right, 17. The Advent movement was a youth movement. Jane Andrews had preached a thousand sermons by age 21, I hear. Uriah Smith was 23 as editor of the review. Um, the pictures look like our pioneers are old men and women, but it was really a young adult movement. Here's James and Ellen White in the middle down here, 1859. And uh, by the way, they were told by photographers not to smile. They're, they're not mean or grumpy uh, or sad, or uh, it was just not practice like today that we grin and say cheese at, at every picture. And then uh, recently, just a few years ago, uh, a picture surfaced. This is a fairly new picture that was discovered of Ellen White here in the middle, the, the little brownish, yellowish, faded picture. Uh, that's Willie White and his wife on the right to really to the left of Ellen White and Ellen White in the middle. I think there was a general conference session from 1905. So a lot of information. I have a part two in two weeks that is very important, two, three weeks or so, uh, on how do we read Ellen White? Uh, what's the context of her writings? And how do we deal with her? I have a statistic in there from eight, uh, 1982 from a professor that I had a 
class with at Andrews, fascinating. He found, uh, I'll give you a little appetizer. He found in a study that the people who claim sola scriptura and say, I'll just read the Bible, I'll just stick to the Bible, read the Bible less than the people who also read Ellen White. Uh, I will share that study with you uh, next time. My recommendation is ignore the internet. There are some mean-spirited, toxic people on the internet that uh, make false claims, I think, uh, about Ellen White. I would recommend, if you have never really read Ellen White and are prejudiced against her, and I should just read the Bible, just start reading. If you read just a little bit every day, you will read a lot in a year and, and judge for yourself. Some statements are difficult. Um, some quotes are a challenge, but overall, highly inspiring, therapeutic, healthy, literally, and helpful, insightful. And she wrote as a mother of four children, two of which died. She lost her husband early. He overworked. She was a real person, but I think sent from God for our help in the, in the end. Those are my initial thoughts on the, the, the biblical concept of Ellen G. Y. And we can say amen. <laughs> you were uh, saying that <laughs> few people in Europe can say amen, but I have learned <laughs> to say amen. amen. And I think yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think it's so beautiful. Sister White says that when we say amen, it's actually a response to the angels that the message has uh, reached our heart. So I that's think right. it's so beautiful. Yeah. So. Uh, oh. I, I was confirmed as a Lutheran, and uh, I, I remember I didn't go to church much, hardly ever. But Sunday morning in a in a Lutheran church, I, I don't think it's like that anymore. But when I grew up, oh, it was very stoic German. You don't show emotions. You you are in church. There's reverence. I have to say, and we we sometimes don't have that reverence. But uh, you just go sit. Listen, stand up, and go home. Uh, <laughs> but the and, uh, Lutheran Church has very good apple strudel. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Other countries, um, <laughs> very different church experience. <laughs> very different. <laughs> so, well, wait a minute. Minute. thank you for sharing it. I love the way that you teach. You break it down, and it gets so clear and so interesting. And um, I used to sometimes write, like put her things to music. So that vision, I once tried to sing it and it seemed she was rising higher, far above this old world and the Advent people. I remember like 40 years ago, trying to sing her, her yeah. story in that. So as you were saying it, I was like, yeah, I, I know that having that kind of picture needs to come back to us. Because it, we we do get distracted, weighted down, and when when you say people who read Ellen White also read the Bible more, I believe that's really true. I do. Yeah, thank you for that, Marilyn. I'm making a note for my next presentation. Uh, you reminded me of something. When you read the the Conflict of the Ages series, what we call it in English which is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Beautiful book on the Old Testament. Oh, it's so insightful just for practical life. And then the end of the last book, Great Controversy, it's Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and then Great Controversy. It is chiastically designed. It starts with God is love, and the Great Controversy ends with that God is love. Um, there's intelligent design in her writings. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So why do, you, why do you think that you were not allowed to use the first vision picture? <laughs> uh, 
I don't want to make the church look bad or, or talk bad about the church. That I was actually told that while I was still an ordained minister of the Seventh Day Adventist Church and on the payroll. Wow! So it's a copyright issue. Um, it's a painting. Yeah. The painting is copyrighted, and they are tightly controlling copyrighted material. Uh, interestingly, my my website was very pro Adventist. Uh, I, ordained minister. I wasn't selling anything. I wasn't soliciting money. Um, there's no credit card place for it, even to this day. So I was surprised that um, I could not use it as an employee of the Adventist church. <laughs> but it must be plain human copyright issue, similar to the name Seventh-day Adventist. Um, right. So, um, Engel, um, the book Evangelism, people are sharing that that is uh, so many things. Leroy Froome have, uh, you know, that's a book Leroy Froome somehow have uh, taken quotes out of the context. And uh, so that people uh, do think that people, uh, uh, what shall we say, uh, somehow mistrust her also because some of the books are changed yeah that's a that's a huge issue uh real quick burn yeah uh what was i going to say it the the 501 and and status with the government is really hurting the adventist church in germany right now we have a pastor who claims to be bisexual uh you might have followed that issue uh and uh, the union has, or the conference has not fired him. And I think the reason is not so much theology or agreeing, disagreeing with him that we are under German labor laws now. And it is much more difficult in, in Europe to fire somebody uh, than it is in the United States. So we've, we've created a problem ourselves with how, how we organize the church. Uh, we know for a fact that in evangelism, we got two problems. In in the book evangelism, the subtitles are not inspired or Ellen White, Ellen White Estate and others have added subtitles that can then mislead the sound of the quote, make it sound Trinitarian. For example, I do know of one quote, I have it in my pamphlet number one, on the Holy Spirit walking in our camp uh, as a person there, evangelism puts a period in a quote where the original source from Ellen White has a comma and says something else that then changes the perspective of the entire quote. You, you stop the sentence, mid-sentence where there's a comma and put a period. The, the message is lost. And, uh, and uh, in the great controversy, we have a change from Jesus divinity and then the word deity is used not by Ellen White but by editors uh, I know on the Holy Spirit where Ellen White wrote it we have changed the it to he even though she says he the Holy Spirit at times she also says the Holy Spirit it and then we made it a he I was on a committee and a and a scholar quoted Ellen White and apparently solved a huge issue with one quote. And I thought, oh, that's too good to be true. We we looked at the original. And what had happened was what he was quoting was from a devotional that was published later where the language was made gender inclusive, men and women. Ellen White originally wrote about men so sometimes perfectly fine to say men and women uh, regardless of our culture today or not uh, the intent of the quote but what she had written was changed uh her original <clears throat> steps to christ had 12 chapters it now has 13 uh, she ellen white herself was so upset with the church one point she had steps to christ published by a non-adventist publisher <laughs> she couldn't trust the brethren um, so that, that doesn't help anybody when we change the writings of a, a dead author, um, 
can't do that. It has to be frozen. We have to be careful with compilations. I don't go as far as saying that some statements she didn't say that she did say, we just have to live with those statements, wrestle with them. And in the context of the Trinity, for example, a phrase like heavenly trio. I personally wouldn't use that phrase now because of the baggage and the misunderstanding. But if you imagine you're writing and Trinity is not an issue and you're writing in a time the church is not Trinitarian, it's not a debate, except in some pockets maybe, and you're writing heavenly trio, then it's it's not a Trinity statement at all. And the author then didn't have Trinity in mind or going the direction of Trinity. It, it's just a phrase to summarize Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now we take phrases like that and listen to them, Heavenly Trio, with, with Trinitarian ears and say, oh, there's the Trinity. So they wrote some statements that are tough for us because their context was vastly different and they made statements not within our debate, but with, within their issues. We have to keep that in mind. I, I would, I think I've mentioned that before, <laughs> the hands come up. I would challenge the Ellen White estate that we republish her writings based on original handwriting manuscripts. Stop the compilations. We have enough compilations now. All the devotionals, uh, it's too much. We have way too much information now. And reduce it and republish her writings based on, on handwriting, original manuscripts, and then leave it at, at that. But yeah, it's a big issue in our movement. Brother Ricky, good to have you with us. And Amanda, I can see your hand. There you are. You have to unmute, brother. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, something that um, troubles me is I read the book of Acts and I read the book of Joel and it talks about, you know, multiple people prophesying and, um, you know, a great manifestation of the spirit of prophecy. And that, you know, Ellen White died um, over 100 years ago. And I, I, I often ask uh, the question to myself, you know, why haven't we had uh, the spirit of prophecy active for uh, this long of a period of time? And of course, with that is why are we still here? You know, but uh, I think the thing that I keep coming back to in my mind is that I think it's because we haven't appreciated the gift uh, that God gave us through Ellen White. Um, you know, many people read her books, um, although it's even even that is, you know, not perhaps not the majority of Adventists, uh, unfortunately, but how how many have actually read the testimonies? And um, you know, reading Ellen White is 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 good. All of her books are good, but she wrote specifically to uh, our people, the testimonies. And it's in those books that God has directly communicated to his people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look at, um, you know, I've, I've had to change things in my own life, of course, but I look at uh, the people as a whole, the Adventist people, and it seems that so few of her counsels are actually being practiced. Uh, how we dress, how we eat, how we conduct our services, and uh, various uh, things like that. You know, I, I, I see so little of the counsel being followed. And, you know, I personally, I, I feel like the way the the state of the Advent people are now, uh, I don't believe that God is looking favorably upon us. I believe that uh, we're seen not just what it doesn't matter where our membership is, whether we're at the mainstream or not. 
I think he I think heaven views us as apostate and we have to examine ourselves you know are we walking in the light are we reading the testimonies and applying it because that was specifically written for us uh, uh you know the the conflict series and that that's good you know and but that's that's for the whole world to read but the testimonies are you know specifically for us so i just wanted to uh share that yeah thank you ricky um I read the testimonies during my PhD time. I needed a counterbalance to all these theologians. Uh, it took me two years. And I was shocked and challenged. And I had to put it down several times because exactly that. I thought I am so far away as an Adventist and as a pastor from following this council. That is, it was almost discouraging. I'm not saying the testimonies are discouraging. It, it's discouraging that, that there's such a gap between implementing what she wrote and what we're doing. And so I, I think you answered it, Ricky, yourself. Why would God send another prophet when we're not even following what he has already sent? And that has happened before. The, the voice of God is actually a technical term among the Jews, the Kol Adonai, the voice of God was silent 400 years into testamental period. Uh, Jews claim uh, because the people of God did not listen to God anymore. And so God backed off and said, if, if you don't want to listen, then I will no longer speak. And some of the intertestamental books are very insightful. Um, historically but uh and that's what made the voice of john the baptist then so loud and again but the the testimonies is a serious issue and that would be a test of fellowship and adventism we as a church the the advent movement will take the testimonies and go through and what what is she counseling us to do and are we even willing to discuss it? And then how far are we willing to, to implement it? And and uh, we would lose the majority of our church members, uh, mm -hmm. I would think. <laughs> we have uh, two people, three people with us today who have not been on your meetings before. So I want to ask, I have never been to a meeting, Yolanda, where you have not been uh, commenting or questioning, or now I want to hear your beautiful voice. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to know where Yolanda lives and is from. My dear sister, oh. Isa. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I always comment, but I was going to allow other people for a change to speak. Um, and uh, Brother Ingo, I am living in New Mexico. Era, no, I'm in Rodeo, New Mexico. <laughs> oh, I, I wanted to say Ujamba, Mama, Habarigani, but I cannot just assume. I, I don't know what that is. Is that Jamaican or something? It's Swahili. Swahili. Okay, yeah. No, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. So, yeah, <laughs> English is all that, I know. Oh, I've been to Detroit, Michigan. That is the mission field. Amen. Amen. A lot has happened there, and I left. Yep. And so it, it's gone down quite a bit, but yeah, it's happening everywhere, I think. But but welcome to our little group. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Eva has invited me before, and I've also been on another platform, Pastor Mark uh, Lastimoso. And so... Yes. Yes, God is introducing me to lots of truth, and Sister White's writings are definitely <laughs> profound, and she is a woman of God, a prophetess. Um, I've encountered people that don't want to entertain her writings, but ultimately, I would just think that, why? <laughs> like you said, you know, why? Because she doesn't contradict the word of God. If anything, she points to the word of God to trump her writings if she right. were to contradict. So it's just Satan that would have us um, not receive all the light that God is trying to give us. 
Amen. Thank you. Good to hear your voice again. And then I, I just I just looked up Rodeo, New Mexico. Oh no, you see where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I have a horse, and I just resonated with what you said that my <laughs> horse, I love her to death. I don't love her to death, but you know, um, it's it's hard to resist them. And so she's got one eye, Palomino paint, beautiful girl. And so yeah. I hug on her every chance I get to. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. And then uh, Wayne and Sister Linda. Hello. I have really, in, uh, we've really enjoyed your presentation. Is it Ingor? It, it's Ingo. It's like bingo Ingo. without a B. Okay. Just, uh, I'll I, remember I, I, that. Ingo. Um, in relation to what others have said about spirit prophecy, uh, one of the things that I didn't mention in my uh, testimony yesterday was when I was coming into the church, my first wife had been Adventist and then she left the church and then through a series of events, um, she said that she would, she prayed and told God that she would do whatever she could to get me in the church. So as I was coming in, um, she would say, well, Mrs. White says we shouldn't do that. And Mrs. White said we shouldn't do that, this and that. And I, I finally said, who is this Mrs. White anyway? I want to talk to her. And she says, well, she, you can't talk to her because she died in 1915. I said, well, lucky for her because I, really, I wanted to give her a piece of my mind. But then after I started reading uh, Steps of Christ and Zyre of Ages and, and Great Controversy and other of her writings as like, I cannot wait to meet her uh, in the heavenly in the heavenly courts because uh, uh, reading her um, her her um, for lack of better words, reading her writings and the gift that she was given um is just phenomenal and so uh, now i look forward to meeting her in, in a different way and again i appreciate your presentation today thank you brother wayne yeah so anyone else have some comments or questions um my my paper is at ingosorky.com under studies i think and then there's a button for ellen white uh, I, I tried to produce one page papers instead of books or booklets easy to print cheap lightweight um starting today i'm working on part two a practical context and how to read some quotes it's four pages long right now. My next two weeks, I need to reduce it to one page. <laughs> it is so hard to take out information and quotes, and but it needs to be one page. Then I need to translate it into, into German and Spanish and Finnish. <laughs> yeah, brother Jer Jerry. Please. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and all that. And uh, I just like to, because I'm kind of new to this, because I've been only about two years, perhaps a bit more, since I discovered Adventism, or I like to say that I was led into it because basically the way I found it was. I got on my knees and I had to ask, like, please show me the truth, no matter what it is, like, no matter how hard. And step by step, he took me, even with miracles and all that kind of stuff. But And um, it was Walter Pyatt who actually did the, most of the work in the end. I'm sure it has happened to many people, but luckily I was already suspicious of the Trinity, like before becoming a Christian, because it didn't make sense, you know, like, and I read about the Aryan Christians and all that, and I always felt pity for them, you know, because it felt like that their point was 
made sense more than the Trinity. But anyway, I was pretty shocked when I found my way to the corporate church here in Finland because all the stuff that I learned from Walter Pye and he talks about Ellen White a bit as well. So I was shocked when I went to the church for the first time, like on fire, basically. And nobody talked about Ellen White. Nobody talked about the Mark the Beast or the papers. You know, I was like so excited, like, yeah, let's go there and, you know, all this. But, and no health message. Like, it was just like any other Sunday church, which I had visited before. Like, even worse, perhaps, because it was it's a disappointment. And, uh, and, uh, but luckily, uh, I well, I don't think they want me there anymore because I think they know by now that I'm with the enemy, basically. But uh, but uh, I asked them that like, could I have some books? Could I have some you know Ellen White books and stuff like that? And luckily, the secretary there was very happy to give me lots of you know this stuff and like I have loads of her books because they just had it on in their basement and like I accepted her almost right away and I didn't know like why was nobody talking about her like all of these amazing quotes and like always when I and like even one of my dreams was answered through Ellen White's writings like a year ago I mean a year after I saw the dream and I didn't understand all the parts of it it was like very biblical kind of you know symbolism all this but only like a year after like it was a month ago or something I got an answer through Ellen White like writing from a uh, desire of ages like and it was amazing like I was in tears and all this and I have no doubt that like she's you know what she said and what the pioneers said so I don't know I just want to share that because it's, it was such a disappointment for me to to see how lukewarm and uh, basically yeah the church was so, <laughs> I'm glad so that so you're teaching us that we should actually use, uh, you know, the spirit of prophecy more than we do. You know, well, when yeah. I came into the church, you know, I just love to read her books. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was an important step for me. Like Ellen White really, like there was always something new and something that seemed to fit the moment. But the Bible was there as well. Like it really made me understand the Bible as well and to inspired me to actually try to read the bible like that was the great thing because the bible can be an intimidating book you know like especially for a new person the faith like but she just made it seem like okay it actually makes sense and you know these are real people in the you know if you read the well you know i have the grand con i had to get this like 1880 uh, 1870s and 1884 and all these versions because i want to see like is there any changes in them? I know they are a bit shorter than the original, I mean, the bigger ones, but still. But uh, yeah, like, it's just, it's just frustrating. And I'm still talking to some people who are in the corporate church and they don't seem to know much about Ellen White. It's weird. Like, they had all these books in their basement, like just sitting there, like in English, in Finnish, in whatever and luckily they gave some a lot of them to me but like even these like indexes of her writings like three books like like that's amazing like she really must have like they must have so much to read yet it's uh and the health message that she gave like i've been reading with brother jan from denmark you know every sabbath we in the morning we meet on zoom and we read from the councils on diet and foods like we read a few a yeah. couple of pages perhaps because we've been struggling with this and I, I struggle still with this like with some you know sometimes I buy something candy or something like this but she has been really helping me as well like with these testimonies and with the advice and and it all makes sense even like it all makes perfect sense like it's I've never read anything there are some tough quotes as people say but most of what she like it just makes sense and it's beautifully written and yeah i just want to say that because i'm new and new around these circles and uh, it feels like she doesn't get enough credit Amen. you know from my point of view because i'm a new one so yeah thank you for sharing brother you're welcome yeah. and 
thank you Ingo, as well for the nice presentation yeah th thank you for joining us uh, your experience is not uh, isolated or unique um several people have told me they came to the truth and the church through walter weiss and then they go to a local church and it's a totally different reality and experience uh i see Vern's hand is up just real quick uh I was walking with a conference president in Germany in the winter. It was cold and we wanted to catch up on life. And he said, Ingo, do you know who? Oh, I was in the meeting. I didn't have any say, but Walter Weiss was banned to speak in Adventist churches in Germany. He's, he's not allowed to speak in an Adventist church. It is a long history and story. But I, I was there when they voted. I didn't really know what was going on. I was a guest speaker somewhere. And, and then we went for a walk. And the conference president said, Ingo, do you know who the number one soul winner is evangelist in Germany? And I'm thinking, Olaf Schur. He said, Walter Weid. <laughs> the, the man they just banned from speaking in church my conference president, not my conference president, a conference president said he's he's the number one that brings people to the Adventist church in Germany. Yeah, I saw your hand again, Wayne. Yeah, I That's wanted right. to. Wayne had his uh, hand up. I wanted to uh, make a comment about um, Jerry, and don't ever consider yourself the enemy. Um, if you know. Truth is truth, and the enemies of truth are lies. And if somebody is considering you an enemy, uh, they need to look at their own self in the mirror. Because, um, you know, my wife and I haven't been to church for four years at least, and um, we used to be involved. We were held offices in the church. Uh, she was health ministries and I was personal ministries and uh, our pastor would not let us speak the way we felt impressed to speak. It wasn't against the church. It was, it was in favor, but being a conference man, he wouldn't let us talk about health, not from the pulpit or anywhere. So, um, don't take on that uh, mantra of being an enemy because you're not, you're, you're seeking truth and that's what we all need to be doing. I could just say quickly about um, how I found this movement, because that was pretty funny because I didn't, I only went for a couple of months or a few months. I went to the corporate church because, and I noticed quickly, yes, that like something is very wrong here. And that is already like the Trinity, even though, Walter Fyde, he said, like, yeah, the Trinity and all this. And I really looked up to him, you know, like, but I, something just didn't, you know, fit the whole picture there. But um, then when I was at the corporate church one day and I went home and I got a text message that like, oh, my husband saw that this one person gave you this book and, uh, and the name of the book. And like, we just want to tell you that like this book does not represent the current views of the church and I had never heard of that book like never and nobody gave me this book so they had mistaken identity that like somebody had given so of course naturally I went online to see like okay what is this book that they're talking about and uh, well it was this kind of an untried trinity book that was written by a Finnish Adventist like a few years ago and <laughs> it was banned immediately and the the man was this fellowship immediately and and all that kind of stuff. But of course, the, I found his web page, like his website and his YouTube channel and all this. So of course, and this was like a prayer answer because I had prayed that like from God, like I I found this church, I found the truth, but something is wrong, you know, like please show me like what's wrong and show me the way because I'm stuck now because I know that there's something great. And that was the light, you know, like when I found this, that when I found that like the Trinity is not originally part of Adventism, it's such a revelation and like, you know, like praise God that he just very quickly showed me the way out of the corporate and to the actual Amen. 
they happened or something, you know. Amen. Well, you are welcome to join our Zoom church. <laughs> Thank you. I've been taking part. I've been, well, both with the Finnish group, small group, and uh, also with, a. Uh, have been joining several different, you know, ministries from time to time. And, uh, yeah, I. it feels very different than in the corporate church, I must say that, you know, like it's, it feels... <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we have two more hands saying, Do you have time? Oh, yeah. We'll take time. Yeah, uh, Vern, I think you were first. Is my microphone working again? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, the, yeah, the one thing I wanted to br bring up to back up what Brother Ingo said there um, in the book called Movement of Destiny, and I have pretty much all of ri Froome's writings, they were left in the house when we moved here by an Adventist friend that used to uh, own the place. And on page 422, he was speaking of the movement of destiny and what they needed to do after the 1957 uh, questions on doctrine. And he says these words, the next logical and inevitable step in implementing uh, of our unified fundamental beliefs involved revisions of certain standard works so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views on the Godhead. Such sentiments were now sharply at variance with the acceptable fundamental beliefs so set forth in the church manual and it was that quote that got me kicked out because in 2016 that he was quoted as stating that the holy spirit is not the power and presence of god and uh i had been that sabbath school teacher up until that quarter i refused to teach it so i resigned said i was going to take a break and the first thing read that week was that quotation from him and i said well what do you do with that folks what what about this one from spirit of prophecy in november uh, from the pen of Ellen White in 1897, it says the Holy Spirit is the power and presence of God. I said, so this class has told me before they believe in the inspired writings. What do you folks do with that? And then I read the verse that um, he was quoting, I believed out of context, and I countered it with another verse. I said, what do you think about these? And the next thing I know, I was called before the church. So, you know, these things are being done. And sadly, very boldly so, like this is this is in writing for all to buy and read. And thank you, uh, Warren, uh, Wayne, uh, there for edifying about the 501c3 because I make my living at accounting and most people are fairly ignorant in the general public of what you do when you sign up uh, Canada to be uh, a, a society or in the States to be a registered uh, charity. Um, there is a set of statements that you must agree to to take out your license. And those statements are statements that require retraction. In other words, in the States, a little different in Canada. In Canada, if you fail to meet all those principles that you laid out in your application, they can withdraw your status at any time in the future and can hold you accountable for the things you fail to fulfill. Well, in the States, for instance, it is required that you accept all persons if the United States General Conference speaks out against the personal preference for sexual orientation uh, publicly, they could actually have a backdated retraction, which would require them to pay back all the funds that they and their propitiants had received as tax deductible status. It has huge, huge ramifications. And this has a massive control. I sat on school board here in British Columbia and I warned them against accepting the public funding. And they said, well, why? Like, you know, and I said, well, first of all, you will weaken of the heart of the people to give when they see there's sufficient funds. They won't give of sacrifice to educate their children, their grandchildren, their neighbor's children, their fellow members' children. And I said, it will eventually end up in the failure of the school system. That was in 1994. And in British Columbia, we're down to a handful of schools now when we were one of the strongest Adventist school systems in North America. All our local schools have changed and all of them ran out of funding. Yet prior to that, they were the strongest schools in the North American Conference with large donations and large funding. But people's heart is where their money is. And when their money's there, they're also involved personally. But when you let the government come in and do it, the people no longer help the poor. They no longer promulgate the truth. They leave it all up to government institutions to do so. And I, I sat in, a sadly, a general church meeting one day when there was an appeal given to the church to help a single mother and her child. She was just asking for one month's help while she got up, up and running. And they they were kind enough to give her the address to the local welfare office. Um, the church was quite capable of providing her needs, 
but they felt there was government offices that were capable of dealing with that. We'll put the funds where they're more needed. Um, she'd appealed to the church, not the government was the sad thing. And unfortunately, uh, I don't condemn any one of them for it, but that's where we become in our mindset. When we look not to the spirit of prophecy in our hearts, but when we look to the way things are done uh, by the government and the local people. So mm -hmm. thank you again, uh, Ingo, for bringing those to the front. Thank you, Vaughan. So I think we uh, take the two last hands and then we have to get to a close. So I think it's first you, Ricky, and then you, Wayne. Yeah. Um... Uh, going back to what Ingo was talking about with uh, small companies, uh, I think it's extremely important. Um, just based on my own experience, I actually came into Adventism through um, a group that met in a house. I'm not saying that's the solution, but um, there was something very special about um, being close together with with people, you know, where you can bond and it's social um rather than just sitting and listening all the time and uh i think it's extremely important uh and so i put a lot of thought into recently uh how to actually implement this because you know going back to the apostolic assembly they are our model not the pioneer church you know they the pioneers did a lot more right than what we're doing today but the apostolic uh, assembly is the uh, the model that we ought, that's it's like the perfect model and uh, so how do you combine um, meeting in a uh, a close setting with you know a few people because they the assembly back then uh, you know like it would say Corinth the church in Corinth it was the whole city there was thousands of people in Corinth they weren't meeting in the same building. So they were meeting in homes. How do we uh, reconcile that with Ellen White when she says that we should raise up memorials? Uh, and she says to do it all over the world. Every single town, village, city should have uh, a standing physical memorial representing uh, God in the Sabbath. And so I thought a lot about this and I've just, you know, personally, I've, I've been trying to buy a property. I, I look at the property taxes, the cost of building, and the, the price is going way up, especially since COVID. You know, how do we practically raise up memorials um, in every place, you know, and, and justify doing that when the tithe and the donation should be focused on the gospel work? And so the idea that it was partially due to my wife here um, was to have uh, garages, like a garage you can build for $10,000 um, here in the States, $10,000. Um, and and uh, a house could be a quarter million dollars or a building, you know, half a million dollars. Um, and so I thought, you know, why not put many of these up very cheaply? Um, they could be insulated if you're in the north. Uh, there can be outdoor toilets. Um, that some, you know, it might be kind of like going back, but the alternative is putting so much money into expensive buildings when we can have uh, just a few, you know, 20, 30 people meeting in in a in a building. It can have windows and you know, it can be cheerful, but it's like, um, how do we do this? How do we implement practically the Council of Ellen White to put assemblies up all over the world? And I feel like this might be a, a, a possible solution. You know, in not every country it's going to work that way. Like in Africa, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in Nigeria right now, and uh, we're trying to look at, you know, how do we raise funding for these? And um, we just huts you know you can fit 20 people in a hut there and you can put huts all over the place and so it's like how do we finish the work and i think we have to look outside the box uh so i just wanted to share that how we can practically have small companies and and be able to 
you know, practice what the Apostolic Assembly did, what Ellen White said. There, and this isn't the only idea. I'd like to hear other ideas. And uh, it's something I think we should look at. Last word will be prayer. But uh, can you imagine what God had originally intended with the Garden of Eden and what how we live now, how we eat, how we function with government and what we have made of the world and us is uh, unbelievable. It's a sad commentary. Uh, Ricky, just real quick. Um, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses, their church buildings are standard all across the United States, uh, possibly around the world. They're standard size. The, the local Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall does not have to come up with a million-dollar architecture plan, and they, they're pretty much all the same, very efficient. Um, so they, they, they understood this principle. But let's pray together. Let's remember each other. Um, when the digital stuff is turned off, we still have real lives. And, uh, well, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, it is a privilege that we are even able and invited to speak to you. That you listen, that you warn, caution, discipline us. We want to submit to you, not governments, not human sophistries and systems, but to you and your voice, and also your prophetic voice. We have ignored so much, we ask for forgiveness. We pick and choose as is convenient. We pray that we are receptive to your counsel and correction too, course correction, realignment, and what we need to do and, and what we not need to do here in this final phase. Teach us. I pray for your blessing for Jerry and his family in Finland. Fresh in the faith. Teach him, guide him with your wisdom. Challenging. Isolated sometimes. We thank you for this sweet fellowship. I thank you for Wayne and his wife. Uh, new in this group, I want to thank uh, you for making my cross uh, path cross with Eva and Tarya and the others, Vern and people poking in and then watching later on on YouTube. I I pray it might be a blessing and a help. We pray for clean hearts, clean hands, clean minds, clean words that come out of our mouth. Grant us your spirit for how we live and act and move and function, especially this week. We thank you for that. Thank you for your son. And thank you for the hope and outlook of not just a better world, a new world starting over. Prepare us for that in Jesus' name. Amen.